adesso passiamo all'ultimo intervento di questa prima sessione. E vorrei dare il benvenuto a B. Wilson, che è un critico gastronomico, una storica, ma anche autrice di cinque libri. E B. utilizza il cibo come un'escusa per farci conoscerci meglio come società, ma anche un'escusa per farci pensare come collegata all'alimentazione con quello che siamo come società. Benvenuta. Welcome. Thanks so much. Um, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I'm sure you don't want me to talk too long. We've had such amazing speakers already. Thank you so much to the Bass Culinary Center for inviting me. It's been amazing to participate in this prize. And thank you, Massimo and Lara. I have dreamed of being in Modena. Um, and along with most British people, I think of Italian food as a kind of dream. And I read Italian cookbooks, and I have just imagined in my mouth so many times eating real tortellini. And then I did two nights ago, and then I said to the Italians at the table, these are so tiny. And they said, no, these are quite large. And I realized there's a kind of just delicacy. And this is what my talk is about. It's the size of a bite. How big is a bite? Sometimes bites are small, sometimes they're large, and the size matters. Um, and I also wanted to say, ah, oh, the things we ate last night, thanks to Massimo, um, on the subject of bites, this incredible black broth that he showed up here called burnt. Um, some chefs, I feel, can cram more flavor into a single spoonful of food than others can onto a whole plate, and you are one of them. There are many kinds of transformation when it comes to food. There are these huge transformations, such as the moment that humans discovered fire and discovered they could cook. But some transformations are as small as a bite. But what I want to convince you is that even a bite is not, in fact, a small gesture. Bites have consequences. One of these, which isn't the main subject of my talk, is historical. I once wrote this book called Consider the Fork. I think in Italian it's called In Punta di Forchetta. I don't know if that's right. Um, it's about the history of human cooking tools and technology. And I had never known this story before I wrote the book. But the way that our teeth are aligned connects with the way that we bite food, the way that we use a knife and fork. So until 250 years ago, give or take, in the Western world, human beings, we used to have an edge-to-edge -edge bite. Sorry, I can't talk and do gestures at the same time and I have no pictures. So if you imagine apes, their teeth fit together like this, edge-to-edge, -edge, whereas humans, we have an overbite. The top layer fits over the bottom layer like a box. And you might assume this was something that goes back to the birth of agriculture 10 or 20,000 years ago. Not so. Archaeologists found it only goes back 250 years. And that's too short for evolution. So what is the explanation? We don't know for sure. But this change in human teeth coincides with the adoption of the knife and fork in Europe. So at this point that we started cutting food into tiny bite-sized pieces before we put it in our mouth, rather than clamping food into our mouth as humans did before, our whole anatomy changes. And I thought that was extraordinary. And the thing, the detail that convinced me that it might be true, I mean, we never know with this kind of archaeology, it's, it's a theory, is that in China, the overbite is seen a thousand years ago. And the reason is the adoption of chopsticks, which happened so much earlier. So that's, bites are important. But the main thing I want to talk about is that if you can change someone's preference for certain foods, you determine whether he or she will eat it. And this has the potential to make someone not only happy, but healthy. 
Our food culture spends all this time talking about things like protein or carbohydrate. Is fat good? Is it bad? But nutrients only matter when someone picks the food up and puts it in their mouth. And the thing that comes before that bite is desire. And I've been struck that so many of the chefs on the shortlist for the Basque Culinary Prize were working at the level of the bite. There were chefs who were working with trying to make a bite of pureed food more delicious for cancer patients. There were chefs trying to teach children about food bite by bite, and chefs trying to push the boundaries of what is edible by rediscovering old plants or reusing waste foods. Chefs are the people who know ways to spark and shape desire and make someone want to put something in his or her mouth. And this is a really powerful thing. If we look at the world today, we have reached this extraordinary, bizarre, tragic state where food, which is the thing that's meant to give us life, currently causes more death and disease in the world than any other factor. It causes more death than tobacco, than alcohol, than air pollution. And we could talk about this and the causes, and we could talk about the nutrition transition that's happened almost everywhere in the world. As countries become richer, they move away from malnutrition, but then they tip into obesity, type 2 diabetes. And we could talk about monocultures and the fact that just 10 crops account for most of what people now eat. But we could also talk about the monoculture of the tongue and the fact that we have such limited tastes. Statistics show, there have been studies done showing that children all around the world now, from Australia to Finland to China, have a preference for roughly the same foods. They eat the same potato chips, the same fizzy drinks, the same breakfast cereals. And this is really strange. It's completely in contrast to the past. And if we want to change this, we have to change the way that people feel about putting different foods in their mouths. And this is actually a big gesture. We sometimes talk about just one bite to a child as if it's something small, but putting something into your mouth is actually huge. To a child who is terrified of a certain food, the act of swallowing a whole bite is immense. How would you feel if I said to you, try just one bite of slug? Go on, try it. Have this slug. It's only one bite, one spoonful. You don't want to do it. It's grotesque. And then it's not even the thought of the taste. With children, as with adults, the th reason we don't want to put something in our mouth, it's the texture. As parents, we sometimes forget that to bite into something new is an act of real courage. And it's something that we as omnivores are reluctant to do because we quite understandably fear that a new food may be something toxic. To eat is something terrifying as well as wonderful because it's this moment when we take something from the world outside and put it inside ourselves. And we know that to like a food, a child may need to try it 10 times, 14 times in a positive atmosphere. But there's a catch-22 because if you hate the food, Trying the food is not a positive atmosphere. It's horrible. But there is a way around this. There is a new technique which was pioneered by psychologists in the UK and US. And it's like the tortellini. It's called tiny tastes. And the idea is that if you can make the piece of food being tried as small as a pea or even a grain of rice, suddenly it's possible for the child to put it in their mouth and then the like may come in time. And I'm telling you, it works. I've done it with my youngest child. He was my picky eater. And I never thought I would be praising him, saying, well done, Leo. You spat out the mushroom. That's great. Because you praise the child, even if they lick it and spit it out. That's wonderful. I was saying, bravo, you spat it out. But it really, really does work. And over the past year, I've become part of a small group in the UK setting up a new charity called Flavor School. And we're trying to help every child in Britain build a healthier relationship with food. And it's through the senses. And it, we're based on a system that's been used across Scandinavia, 
and the Netherlands for many years, and it goes back to this idea in France called Les Classes du Goût. Um, and the thing I've learned from doing Flavor School, it's mostly delivered by teachers, but I've been doing it for two summers with a group of four-year-olds and five-year-olds, is that when it comes to trying food, the bite part really comes last. So in Flavor School, we do all these things with food before we taste it. Sometimes we just touch food. We bring fuzzy peaches into the class and we just feel them. And that's quite nice. And you don't have to put it in your mouth. You might just want to get to know the peach. Or we listen to food. We put on headphones and we try hard rye crackers and soft brioche. And we talk about the silence of strawberries and how celery is noisy. And sometimes the child doesn't want to put the celery anywhere near their mouth, and that's fine. You can just crack the celery near your ear and listen to it that way. And sometimes we just look at food and write down words about it. Before you feel brave enough to try a raw tomato, you might just want to describe it. And the children say things like, the tomato is like a football. And then another boy will say, no, it's like a rugby ball. And then another boy says, no, it really is like a football. And then someone says, the stalk of the tomato looks like a star. And a five-year-old girl said this to me a couple of weeks ago, and I thought, I have never seen that the stalk of a tomato looks like a star. But it does, and it's beautiful. And sometimes in this rush to bite food, maybe I have just missed things about it. Um, and one of the things we do in Flavor School that makes it easier to taste is to say no one has to like anything. And I did a session with a group of children tasting lemons. And by saying you don't have to try it, it's like reverse psychology, and 11 children who had never tried lemon before were putting it in their mouths. And one boy said, I don't like this, it's sour, it tastes like poison, I'm going to try another bit. And to me this was, again, great. It's like, we don't have to force pleasure, but just to experiment with food is something magical. And sometimes, it doesn't matter very much if you like something. And sometimes this question of tiny tastes is a matter of life and death. I researched a different book called First Bite, and I interviewed an amazing man called Keith Williams in America, who works with children who have severe selective eating disorders. Many of them are on the autistic spectrum, and they sometimes have to be fed by a tube just to get enough food to survive. And Williams created this new version of Tiny Taste called Plate A, Plate B. And it's still the same idea, it's very, very small. But Plate A has the new foods that you want to learn how to like, but they're as small as a grain of rice. So you might have, say, maybe chicken and carrots and rice on that plate. And then Plate B is the foods that the kids like, which is mostly hot dogs or fries or whatever it might be. And that's like normal size portion. And for the whole meal, they take one bite from plate A, one from plate B, one, 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 until the meal is done. And they do this every day for three meals. And it does seem that somehow, by pairing these two foods together, the plate B foods then become something that the child will willingly consume with pleasure. And one of the children Williams worked with was Tyler, he was a 16-year-old boy, but his food restriction was so acute that for nine years he had been fed by a tube. He had the height of a 10-year-old and the weight of a 9-year-old, and he only ate three foods. He ate ham, cereal, and pasta, but he would only eat the pasta if it was farfali. Um, and we joke about picky eating, but for kids like this, it's no joke. But over a two-week course of doing plate A, plate B, the therapists at Penn State Hershey, who work with Keith Williams, succeeded in getting him to enjoy 78 different foods that he ate willingly. Um, and now suddenly meals were something sociable for him again, and he could actually eat with his parents. And he'd moved from the loneliness of tube nutrition to the social interaction of a shared meal. So what I'm saying is that bites matter. 
and that it's through the bite that we can enact personal change, but also social change. So many of us, even if we're not as extreme as Tyler, believe that the way we eat is something fixed, it's something innate, and it's something we can never change. And people say, I'm a chocoholic, as if that's something fundamental about us. But the thing we forget is that humans are amazing at learning new tastes. The human olfactory system is the only part of our central nervous system that is open to the world. And we retain this openness throughout the human lifespan if only we allow ourselves to. We can change our tastes at any age. There is no need to have this monoculture of the tongue. In contrast to all the other things we work on in life that are so much less likely to increase our happiness, it's astonishing how little effort we put into changing our eating preferences. But the wonderful secret of being an omnivore is that we can adjust our desires even late in the game. You were a child once, too. When you arrived in the world, your only food preferences were milk and buried memories from your mother's diet. Those early weeks were dominated by meals, the stab of hunger, the sweet contentment of being sated. But you could not yet tell dinner from breakfast. You didn't yet know, lucky you, what a trans fat was or what was a frappuccino. No one had taught you to worry whether you were getting enough protein or to feel guilt when your stomach was full. You had never watched a fast food commercial. On the relative merits of quinoa and macaron, you had no opinion. Food was wide open for you. The great garden of ingredients, from bitter greens to sweet dates, were all equally unknown, all new, all strange, all waiting to be discovered. Bite by bite. Thank you. Thank you.